When I was 13, the country I grew up in faced a month-long lockdown in the middle of winter. There was no viral outbreak, no toxic chemicals leaking from unfettered reactor cores. This was man-made, stemming from a threat of war by an immense foreign power. Television sets sang with patriotic jingles and presidential addresses, and the susurrus of hushed whispers blanketed cities and districts and neighborhoods like a shroud in the night. Where once winter was marked with festivities adorning every corner of the boulevard, it now cast a freezing breath over empty gardens, shuttered windows, and deserted streets. Hundreds of millions brought to a standstill, because two men couldn't agree on peace. My neighborhood was in a commonplace middle-income locality, with squat two-story houses peppered amidst high-rises and grey government quarters. The narrow streets traced their way through tight turnings and past unkempt old garages, littered with garbage from weeks of no maintenance. I remembered walking to school through those lanes when things were normal, and how the old kindergarten by the central square would loom up on me, yellow and red, plastered with paintings of old cartoons. Now, everything looked the same, drab and dismal, alone and abandoned. On the first week of the lockdown, we had to make our scheduled trip to the ration store to get our weekly quota of rice and lentils. Four sets, one each for my mother, father, grandmother and I. It made for miserable meals and offered nothing sweet, but it was sustenance. I offered to go, but my father wouldn't let me. The authorities would only allow one family member from each household to purchase rations on specific days of the week, and he didn't want me to get questioned by the police if they stopped me. I protested, but he didn't cave. Instead, he put his hand on my shoulder and told me that later on, I would understand. My father is a stern, yet amicable man who puts family over everything else. My relationship with him is rather informal. The kind where going out for dumplings at the local tea stall every week was considered routine instead of privilege. Tall and dark and imposing, but almost always friendly. So, when I heard the urgency in his voice, I believed that he truly meant it. The first two weeks passed without much incident. There were rumors of police violence across the city, of dissident and rebel hotspots past the river, and fewer and fewer people were risking going outside to purchase a drink from the local hoarder or a cigar from the tobacco magnate by the boulevard. The silence at night was heavier every day, as if we were being pushed down harder and harder to strangulate and suffocate our very wills. On the third week, my father was called away for what the government deemed essential work, supervising the city mills and searching for signs of sabotage. He knew I would have to bring in the rations now, so before he ventured out, he sat with me in the drawing room. Son, you already know the basics. Carry your papers, stand in the line, ask the policeman for help if someone tries to claim your share. Do not shout, do not run, do not talk back to the guards. I knew all of this. Don't worry, I reassured him. He sighed and leaned back against the wall, closing his eyes. The veins on his arms stood out as he squeezed his fist closed, tighter and tighter. When he spoke, his voice was markedly different. Okay, now I have to tell you the second set of rules. I raised an eyebrow at him. There's another set? Did the police make them? No, no, the police won't tell you this. But you need to listen. Your life and ours will depend on it. I was suddenly aware of the chill in the air, of the wind whistling through the windows and under the door. There are old lands, son, older than you know. There are things that live here that few will believe and fewer have seen. They only come out when it's quiet, when the drone of footsteps and the screech of tires come to a halt. You cannot reason with them, you cannot talk to them, and you certainly cannot comprehend them. They don't abide by our mortal rationality nor by our laws. The wind seemed to cease, and I narrowed my eyes. This had to be a joke. Gallo's humour to cheer me up before I went outside. But my father has never been that kind of man. 
I know it sounds strange, but for my sake and yours, promise me you'll do this. I gulped and nodded. Good. Now, there's really only one thing I'd like you to do here. When you're returning with the rations, it'll be difficult for you to carry everything together. It's a week's supply and it's heavy, and a fair half an hour's walk from home. You'll want to rest a little, to put down the bags and catch your breath on the sidewalk, and that's fine. The only thing you must remember is never do it at a crossing. Never put the bag down and stop with the lanes opening up and heading away from you, all right? I nodded, digesting everything. I didn't understand what this would save me from, but I trusted my father. He wiped a bead of sweat from his forehead and held my face in his hands. Please remember this, please. Do not stop anywhere where there's a lane on your side. I gulped. Can you tell me more? I asked. He pushed himself back up, standing against the wall, packed trolley bags beside him, and helped me get to my feet. I will, son. Whatever my father knew, and his father before him. This isn't the first lockdown this city has ever had. There were others, bigger ones, over the last thousand years. This won't be the last time either. And there were times where there weren't as many people as there are today. This is history, and we must learn from it. With that, he was ushered away by the military, and I saw their rusted red jeep rumble down the road, leaving a wake of dust and discontent behind. I decided to go out two days after that to get the rations. The pink permission slip was tucked tightly into my pockets, and I carried a khaki bag to put most of the rice in. A week's worth of rations for one household of three wasn't going to fit otherwise. I set out at four in the afternoon, my allotted time, the freezing cold boring its way into my bones, making my teeth chatter and turning my breath to mist. The air smelt of dead leaves, and the sky was the colour of steel grey and dark, the sun climbing lower down the horizon every passing minute. I walked down the road quickly, rubbing my hands together every few minutes. There was almost no one else about except a policeman around the block who asked me for my slip and sent me on my way after confirmation. I reached the ration shop about 40 minutes later and stood in line for about 20 more before receiving my share and having my ration card stamped. It was a pitiful selection of only the most basic necessities. Carrots, onions, rice and lentils. Just enough to cover two daily square meals for every person in the household. Stretching it to a week would be difficult, but not impossible. Right as I was about to leave, I saw it. A small packet of something dark brown sitting unguarded on the officer's desk by the shop. Soldier's cocoa. Rich. Sweet, soft bars given to the military as sugar rations to keep them warm. The attending officer was directing the back of the line before the shop, and the package just sat there, untouched. As civilians, we hadn't had anything like this in months. Consumer production had stopped long ago, and there were no imports to speak of. I could almost taste the bar as I looked at it, every instinct telling me to reach out and grab a piece. Fifteen minutes later, I was walking down the road, a heavy bag of rations in each hand and a heavier bag stuffed in my back pocket. The skies had turned a darkening blue with patches of wispy red strewn about. It was going slow and my legs threatened to buckle every moment. My back was in absolute agony and I knew I needed to rest or risk falling face forward onto the hard tarmac. I took a few more steps and sat down with a huff collapsing to the concrete sidewalk, looking around me. The street lamps shone dimly in the dark, casting feeble incandescence on the streets. I was still a good half an hour from home, but this route was a shortcut and full of old, abandoned, industrial buildings, rising from the barren fields like great old rusted beasts. I sat up with a jolt as I remembered my father's words. Was I near a lane? Was I sitting before the mouth of one? I looked around frantically, heart pounding. But no. Thankfully, the road was straight, with no lanes feeding into it 
until about a few dozen meters away. I heaved a sigh of relief. I got up and started walking, trudging slowly. Not five minutes later, I heard a shout. I looked back to see a policeman rushing down the street at me, his shadow long and jumpy against the yellow street lamp. He came to a stop right beside me. Officer, here's my permission slip. I... That's not it, boy. You took it, didn't you? I was genuinely taken aback. I'm... Sorry, sir. I don't know what you mean. He grunted and put his hand in his pocket. He pulled out a white piece of dark brown bars. You took these from the officer at the ration store, didn't you? That soldier's ration, son. Taking that is worse than theft. I almost laughed out loud. I had wanted to take the cocoa, yes, but at the very last moment, I had restrained myself and walked away, not having so much as touched it. I promise you, sir, you can search me completely and you won't find a single piece on me. I know the law. I wouldn't take anything, I pleaded. The officer wasn't buying it, but he didn't seem like he wanted to mete out anything too harsh either. His green epilepsy suggested he was a rookie, maybe six months into the military. He sighed and put his hands on his waist. All right, I'll have to go through your bags then. Come on. I complied, silent. I had nothing to hide. He led me forward until we reached the sizable section of the sidewalk, set me down and went through my bags and backpack. As I expected, he found nothing. He stopped and looked up, dusting his hands together. He looked rather sorry about the whole thing. I guess you were right. The shopkeeper saw you eyeing the pack and figured you might have snapped it up. Probably just got swiped by someone else standing in line. I nodded. I'm sorry to cause you trouble, sir. He smiled and adjusted his rifle strap. Not a problem. You can go back... His words cut away mid-sentence and his eyes focus on something behind me. They narrowed, suspicious, and then widened filling with what I could only believe was dread. There was something, just a few feet from my back, and I couldn't see it. I turned my head slowly, straining my eyes to catch a glimpse of what it might be. My fingers suddenly felt cold, frozen more than the winter chill ever could, and I realized where we were. When the officer had asked me to come forward and set my supplies down, we had stopped before a lane. A narrow, moss-covered pathway fenced on both sides by high white walls of an old, industrial facility, threading away to my left to join a parallel road a few meters away. My father's words echoed in my head, rumbling like thunder, drenching me in yet unfounded fear. I jumped up and looked to where the officer was staring. There was something coming out of the corner, out of where the wall curved to enter the lane. At first glance, I thought it was a human hand. But, as it melted away from the wall, like something breaching the surface of a still sea, I saw it properly in the lamplight. First came the fingers, at least a dozen on each hand, dark and animated, as if made from shadows themselves. The arms followed, impossibly slender, jerking and cracking in the darkness. They were nightmarish, Behind me, the officer stared, open-mouthed, hands on his rifle, unsure. The head followed next. And, as it broke free from the wall, inky black, and turned away from us, I closed my eyes. It wasn't a conscious decision. It was my body reacting to the horrors of what I was seeing, a primeval response to keep my sanity from crumbling. We were both rooted to the spot, unable to move. I forced my eyes open a minute later and let them adjust to the darkness. The street lamps had all gone out and we were covered in a blanket of absolute, impenetrable darkness. It's standing right in front of you, son. I heard someone whisper. The officer had his handgun raised and a tobacco lighter with an open flame in his left hand. The harsh yellow glinted across the firearm and dissipated into the oppressive dark. I could only see a bare outline of what stood in front of me. It was tall, 
easily above seven feet. His fingers twitched like centipedes writhing on the end of dark talons. Its limbs and torso were incredibly slender, only a few inches across the waist, and it shivered as if in unbridled anticipation. As my mind raced to find any rationality in this situation, to quell the terror coursing through my blood, I noticed something. The thing was standing, with its back to me. It was evident from how the meager light from the flame bounced off the curves of bone and sinew near its shoulder, and how the feet, two long, clawed talons, faced away from me. Its face, whatever it was, was turned away. Kid, whispered the officer again, move to your left, I'm going to shoot it. I had to force myself to understand what his words meant. Faced with something so alien, so unreal, my mind was falling to pieces. I tried to move over, but nothing happened. It was as if my feet and hands were weighed down and tied in place like a ship moored at the harbour. I can't, I whispered back, tears streaming down my cheeks. I can't move. I can't move. Silence. Okay, wait there. I'll go around. I heard the scratch of his boot on the road as he shifted to his left to get a better shot. Almost immediately, the thing in front of me moved, mimicking the officer's steps until he was directly opposite to him and standing to my left. What the hell? The officer stepped back from me and the thing stepped back too, inching closer to my left until its writhing fingers was a hair's breadth from my face. The stench of it steamed around me and it smelled like burnt flesh and ash. Stop! I screamed. He's coming closer! The officer stopped in his tracks and retraced them, the thing moving parallel to his steps. If he moved right, it moved right. If he moved forward, it moved forward. The distance between him and the thing was constrained, unchanged, and all the while, it stayed facing away from us, its countenance hidden in deepening shadow. It's too close to you. I can't shoot. I'm going to circle around and push it against the wall so it can't move anymore. I squeezed my eyes shut and heard him move around me as the thing mimicked his position, staying away from him until he stopped. It came to a stop facing the wall beside me, a dozen or so feet behind where I stood. I heard a small exhale and a shot rang out, deafening in this tiny, claustrophobic alley. I looked back at it. The bullet glanced off the thing's back like chalk thrown at a blackboard. Four more shots rang out, each with no more effect than the one before. The bullets fell to the ground, crushed balls of lead glimmering faintly in the light of the dancing light of flame. I turned to look at the officer. His brow was covered with a sheen of sweat and his hands were shaking. He dropped the handgun and set the lighter down on the pavement. Its light threw long, dancing shadows against the pale white wall as he faced down the tall, dark creature. He took his rifle out and fired. A cacophony of shots rang out, the muzzle flash lighting up the whole lane in the flood of white and gold. It was like watching the frames of a hand-cranked film reel as the officer drew in closer and closer to the thing. The world was fire and darkness and gunfire and I could feel my ears ringing and my eyes burning while it built up to a crescendo. Then suddenly, it stopped. My eyes still swam with after images and I craned my neck backwards. My limbs were still frozen, the lighter still flickered, and in that little area illuminated by its wild flame, I saw the officer standing stock still with the thing inches away from him, its many fingered hands wrapped around his face. It had finally turned around. I stood as still as I could, straining to see from the corner of my eye. The thing was lifting up the man by his head, and as I followed him up, my eyes rested on his face. 
It was gaunt, inky black. There were no eyes, no nose, but at the very centre, there was a gaunt, gaping hole, a void lined with a single row of hundreds of small, sharp teeth. It covered nearly its entire visage, pulsating slowly, the teeth shifted and squirming in their lining. I screamed. The creature lifted the man up and put him headfirst into its mouth, all the way to his neck. Please, I yelled. Please, just stop. But my screams were empty. The shrieks of hapless prey resigned to the inescapable. I passed out before those teeth could come down on the flesh and bone, before the sounds of teeth gnashing against flesh would taunt my memory forever. When I woke up, I was at home. The military police had brought me back after finding me lying passed out in an alleyway. There was no mention of the officer. They simply ignored the notion of one of them having been there. Shots had been fired, yes, but on reaching the scene, they'd only found me and empty bags that used to contain a week's worth of rations. They had assumed I'd been attacked by a dissident for the food and narrowly escaped, and I said nothing to disabuse them of that idea. When my father came home at the end of the lockdown, he hugged me and cried until he couldn't any more. He had never seen it before, but he knew what it was, that thing. There was no need to be scared of it now. There were people out and about, and it followed its own rules to the letter. They call it the priest. My grandfather told me about it when I was younger than you are. He wiped away the tears from his eyes and fumbled with a shoddily wrapped package that he took out from his travel bag and handed it to me. He then walked over to the other room and brought over a large binder, its cardboard cover crumbling and rat-eaten, its yellow pages almost indecipherable. I had never read it before, but I knew it was my grandfather's journal. He started going through it, running his fingers across the lines, reading. It lived on this land before humans. Maybe it was here before the animals too. So old that the oldest families in town have accounts of it leading all the way up to the first settlements, when men from another land came here across the oceans to claim ours. When they came ashore, they found the oldest generations of our people praying to something. The outsiders thought it was superstition until one of their parties found a temple in the mountains, a building so big that the rustic natives could never have built it at the conjunction of seven roads. What was it? I had whispered, taking the packet from my father. They didn't know, but it was taller than the tallest ships stacked on each other twenty times. It dwarfed every grand palace and tower of the west by many magnitudes. Every fortnight, the natives would send over a man with lentils and rice as an offering, so the priest that lived in the temple could gather it for his god. The man would leave the offering at the meeting point of two roads and stand away from it. He had to be alone and was on no account to ever approach the offerings or the priest when it came to take the food away, for that would be folly. I had finally unwrapped the package, and two dark, fragrant bars fell out. Soldier's cocoa. The irony was so explicit that I nearly laughed out loud. They tasted warm and rich, and when I fell asleep that night, I dreamt of seven crooked shadows surrounding a giant granite building covered in moss and decay and sporting a single sandstone door. As the years passed, my memory of the incident remained unchanged, as if it were a canvas painted in the dredges of my memory, lacquered with blood. No one but my father and I knew about it, and we vowed to keep it that way. As for why I'm telling this now, it's no mean task to guess. The world is under quarantine, the streets are empty, and if you live on my land, then you must know the perils of it. You must know never to pay tribute to the priest.